Now it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who needs no introduction, as they often say. He's a professor of law at St. John's University. He's the Jackson Center's Elizabeth S. Linné Fellow and a leading, I'd say the leading expert on Justice Jackson. Professor John Q. Barrett not only gives us an insight into the importance of the principles uh, that Bob Jackson established, but to me, just as important, he humanizes the person. Uh, I, I get the biggest uh, charge out of John's sharing with us some of the, uh, last year you shared the fact that when they were at Nuremberg, he took a Christmas recess and took some of the staff off to go skiing. And I understand he wasn't a very good skier, but that wasn't the point of, of, of the whole thing. And so uh, he is our scholar, and he is, I think, the greatest expert on the life and importance of Robert H. Jackson, John Q. Barrett. Thank you very much, Stan, and deep thanks to each of you for what you do for the Robert Jackson Center. There is no assembly in the many populations that are Jackson assemblies that's more vital, significant, and committed than this group right here. Of course, you're geographically at Jackson Ground Zero, but you are financially, emotionally, intellectually visionaries that are leading, really, a world appreciation that will only continue to grow. You have, I hope, many investments, and with life's up and downs and recent markets, maybe some of them aren't surging. But you are investors here, and your rate of return is Madoff-like, <laughs> with reality underneath the substance of your return on your Jackson investment. This life, this name, this body of work, this legacy is not just a growth stock. It is at the top of its potential in reaching domestic and international youth to senior uh, law to horseback riding, you name it, audiences. And that's what your investment um, to date and your future generosity and your emotional commitment to this makes possible. Now, my topic this evening is to take you to this room and this photographed occasion. We are in the 65th anniversary year of the International Military Tribunal proceedings at Nuremberg. And July 26th, will mark the 65th anniversary of Justice Robert H. Jackson's closing statement at Nuremberg. That's this room. As best I can surmise, this is the courtroom rising as the judges take the bench on that July 26, 1946. You see Justice Jackson on the right front corner. Of, I wish I had a pointer, but let me see if I'm portable. Okay, Oprah retires and the field is mine. <laughs> you see Robert Jackson here at the front corner of the American prosecutor table. Looking down across from him in the bow tie is his executive trial counsel, Thomas J. Dodd. Immediately behind Jackson is our dear, dearly missed friend, Whitney R. Harris, who passed away only a year ago. He was the last surviving podium prosecutor from this trial. You see the defense attorneys here, and you see the judicial assistants there. The fellow on the corner with his hands planted is a young French lawyer who has spoken here at the Jackson Center, Eve Bybetter. The judges' papers are visible, but their seats aren't visible. And then you see the other tables, the Russian table here to Jackson's left, and the British table here. Interestingly, the chief British prosecutor, Lord Hartley Shawcross, has been running late apparently this morning because he's not in his chair. David Maxwell Fife, the bald fellow who really did the bulk of the leadership of the British prosecution is there across. And then you see a table of ancillary support personnel. Behind these defense attorneys, of course, would be the 20 defendants in the box. And one thing I love about this photograph is that as everyone else is rising and many are focusing at the judges, Robert Jackson is throwing a glance at the defendants. I don't quite mean to read too much into that glance. It's just a shutter snap on a camera. But I do see him sort of saying, 
I'm about to come at you for the last time and sum up what we have proven about your culpability for crimes beyond the scale of any crimes in human history. I want to note one other person. I wish he could have stayed with us, but he was with us through yesterday. This young fellow here is Sergeant Moritz Fuchs, who was Justice Jackson's bodyguard. There's a, a snub-nosed revolver under that armpit of that young man. It's the only gun in the courtroom. Uh, the MPs who were behind the defendants were armed with nightsticks. Uh, and Father Fuchs spoke, I hope some of you heard him speak yesterday at Chautauqua. Uh, you can see him on YouTube. He is Father Fuchs because this experience galvanized him, affected him, focused his thinking so much that instead of returning to his engineering studies at Purdue University, which had been interrupted by his army service and his fairly grievous wounds in the Hurtgen Forest, which had him in a hospital during the Battle of the Bulge and in a, an odd way probably saved his life, that whole experience with Nuremberg and what this showed him on top of it led him back shortly after this day to the United States, to Fort Dix for discharge, and then to the seminary, and to the path that led him to his career as a Catholic priest for the subsequent 65 years, and he's going strong. Now Jackson's closing argument is the first of the four. He is the chief prosecutor for the United States, and he's followed by Shawcross, his British counterpart, and then Rodenko, the Soviet counterpart, and then the French prosecutor. I want you to think, before we talk about the closing statement, about the path that Jackson had traveled to get to this moment. He, of course, was a sitting US Supreme Court justice. In April of 1945, he'd been approached by emissaries on behalf of President Truman, and he'd been recruited to be the US Chief of Counsel to take on this prosecuting job. At the time he was recruited, the lead defendant who was still alive and envisioned as potentially in the dock was Adolf Hitler. Jackson is done writing his Supreme Court opinions for that term, and he's told that there's evidence assembled, there's an agreement across the allies about procedurally how to proceed. All we need to do is win, which is very imminent militarily, to apprehend, which will be part of winning mil militarily, and then to commence this prosecution. It's a summer job that you can complete and be back on the bench by the first Monday in October, 1945. Now that's the bill of goods that Jackson <laughs> bought. None of it was true. Of course, Hitler didn't show up to be a defendant, and neither did Himmler or Goebbels or a number of the other leading Nazis. Some did survive. But there was no agreement across the alliance. There was no assembled body of evidence. There were no cases teed up and ready to go. And this summer job, which by the way he took without checking with any of his judicial colleagues, turned out to cost him an entire year at the Supreme Court. And that became extremely controversial, including controversy stirred by some of his brethren who were, frankly, jealous of the appointment and bitter about the Jackson absence that caused additional work for them and the duration of this proceeding. So he's losing a year of his judicial career uh, to do this thing. This thing begins with the diplomatic job of the summer of 1945, negotiating, hard negotiating, across the four-sided table at Westminster Abbey to reach the London Agreement, which is the procedural commitment to do this in a way that squares with a sense of fairness. It then involves assembling the staff and the evidence gathering process and drafting the indictment and picking the location and arranging the construction and getting ready to start the trial. That's September and October of 45. It's the opening statement and the start of the trial when they weren't really ready to go. One of his most important assistants, Sidney Kaplan, wrote the day before the trial opened to his wife in Minneapolis, tomorrow Justice Jackson will begin one of the most, the second most important trial, he called it, in the history of man. The first was the trial of Jesus Christ, wrote Sidney Kaplan, a Jew. He said, after this trial starts, the judge will gavel it to order. Jackson will go to the podium and he will deliver a brilliant opening statement. And then we're totally in the soup <laughs> because we're not ready to go. It's chaos. It's improvisation. We're still putting together evidence books. We're still interrogating witnesses. We're still trying to get the order of proof lined up. But they did start that way on November 21. And then across the months, the nine months that lead to this late July 46 moment, they try this case. The four nations, the chief prosecutors and their staff. The US proves the conspiracy to wage aggressive war 
and the breaching of the peace. Jackson and his senior assistants present documentary evidence, powerful film evidence assembled by the Schulberg brothers. Um, they are at the podium, including Whitney Harris in January of 1946. In February, they're done, and Jackson is presenting the very complex, difficult legal argument about the criminality of Nazi organizations. In March, the defendants begin their cases, and Jackson cross-examines four witnesses, not just Hermann Goering, in that month. In April, he's doing more cross-examination, and in May, and in June. He's also managing the diplomatic facet of this, which involves coordination not with just the three allies, but the 18 other small nations which were signatories to the London Agreement and subscribed to this and really were part of what was being vindicated by the Nuremberg prosecution. As this trial moved forward, they wanted a piece of Jackson to fet him, to bring him to Brussels, to Stockholm, to London, to Paris, to Prague. Jackson's doing that traveling. It sounds like you know, a deluxe European vacation until you remember, we're talking 1946. This is rubble hopping. And he's writing profoundly moving, powerful speeches, explaining to those audiences what's being done legally and factually to vindicate what they had experienced as victims of an aggressive war. And then, just to add a domestic flavor to it, in April of 1946, the Chief Justice of the United States, Harlan Stone, had dropped dead. And Jackson had briefly been chosen by Harry Truman to be the successor, and then had been sabotaged by an incredibly dirty domestic campaign which didn't much bother Jackson in terms of the chief justiceship, contrary to some accounts you might read. What a terrible job to be the chief of that crowd was really his view. But to be done dirty, to have people trash him falsely, got under his skin in a big way. And after a new chief had been appointed, Jackson, with perhaps poor judgment, opened up publicly on some of his brethren to defend his good name. And then, of course, he's got to pull this all together. And so in May, across June into July, he begins to write, and that's what this guy did, it's part of his greatness, this closing argument. He does it the Jacksonian way, fountain pen, yellow pad, and a lot of those pieces survive. And then scissors, and they were short on paste pots, so there are stories of scraps blowing around when windows were opened and so forth. But it's assembling pieces, it's getting script typed, it's marking up typing, retyping, et cetera, et cetera. He's working on this summary of the biggest, most important evidentiary presentation prosecutors have made in human history. He steps into this courtroom with all of that, weighing on him, behind him, deep inside of him, and he throws that look, which is a look of focus at the thing that matters most, completing the job with regard to them, the principal Nazi defendants. Now, how do I know this is July 26? There are lots of photos taken by lots of people. I know it because of this. Anna Harris, Whitney's widow, had a lovely phrase. She referred to him as perhaps the second most handsome man in the courtroom. Uh, and she's right about Whitney's good looks. This is Whitney. That's Stuart Symington. What's he doing there? Well, the answer is he's not on the staff, but he is the secretary, the assistant secretary of the army and he's on a tour, and the one and only moment he's in the courtroom happens to be this VIP day. Oh, wow. So when you see Stuart Symington, subsequently United States Senator, you know you're looking at July 26. That's Jackson at the podium. In the previous shot, you saw his son, William Jackson, his executive secretary, Elsie Douglas, and Jackson's script and some of the supporting documentation that were assembled in front of them. Jackson speaks for almost three hours in delivering this statement, with a recess mid-morning that interrupts it. This is, again, you see Stuart Symington over the corner of the podium. Uh, Whitney Harris was moving, so he's the blur. Bill Jackson is turning a page, that's the blur to the left. Uh, but this is Jackson delivering the argument. And it is a summary of the evidence in this sprawling complex trial, which is the history of Nazi oppression and war waging in Europe. Those are the listeners. Now Jackson is the blur. Shutter speed was uh, not so fast and film was even slower in these days. Uh, Whitney Harris, you see, has moved up to Jackson's seat, Symington 
uh, Robert Gill is the guy in the headphone behind Symington, Dodd, John Harlan Amon, Robert Kempner, etc. These are among the Americans listening as Jackson presents his evidence. And, sorry, I could read you, and perhaps in a moment I will read you, uh, passages. Um, I could just suffice to say that it's brilliant and eloquent and it's on the web and it's published and it's used worldwide. It's Jacksonian text and frankly he is an English language Shakespeare of the modern age. That's why we revere him and remember him and I could just say read it for yourself. But frankly better is to hear it for yourself. So I want to cue up a small film excerpt that will give you a sense of Robert Jackson's delivery. As you know, not much of the Nuremberg trial was filmed. Across all these months, less than 30 hours was filmed. But a passage from the closing argument is captured in this excerpt. And as you watch it, not only notice the power of the presentation and the argument, but for fun, see if you notice anything odd about this film. Mr. President and members of the tribunal, an advocate can be confronted with few more formidable tasks than to select his closing arguments where there is a great disparity between his appropriate time and his available material. In eight months, a short time as state trials go, we have introduced evidence which has embraces as vast and varied a panorama of events as has ever been compressed within the framework of a litigation. It is impossible, in summation, to do more than outline with bold strokes the vitals of this trial's mad and melancholy record, which will live as a historical text of the 20th century's shame and depravity. It is common to think of our own time as standing at the apex of civilization, from which the deficiencies of preceding ages may patronizingly be viewed in the light of what is assumed to be progress. The reality is that in the long perspective of history, the present century will not hold an enviable position unless its second half is to redeem its first. These two score years in this 20th century will be recorded in the Book of Years as one of the most bloody in all annals. These men saw no evil, spoke none, and none was uttered in their presence. When we put all of their stories together, this is the ridiculous composite picture of Hitler's government that emerges. It was composed of a number two man who knew nothing of the excesses of the Gestapo which he created. A number three man who was merely an innocent middleman transmitting Hitler's orders without even reading them like a postman or a delivery boy. A foreign minister who knew little of foreign affairs and nothing of foreign policy. A security chief who was of the impression that the policing functions of his Gestapo and SD were somewhat on the order of directing traffic. A party philosopher who was interested in historical research and had no idea of the violence which his philosophy was inciting in the 20th century. Now this may seem like a fantastic exaggeration, but this is what you would actually be obliged to conclude if you were to acquit these defendants. This was the philosophy of the National Socialists. When for years they have deceived the world and masked falsehood with plausibilities, can anyone be surprised that they will continue the habits of a lifetime in this dock? Credibility is one of the main issues of this trial. Only those who have failed to learn the bitter lesson of the last decade can doubt that men who have always played on the unsuspecting credulity of generous opponents would not hesitate to do the same now. It is against such a background that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this tribunal as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say I slew them not. And the queen replied, 
then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slain, that there has been no crime. Extremely powerful words. One way to be the modern Shakespeare, of course, is to know your Shakespeare. <laughs> and that was Richard III. And Jackson wrote that from memory in his first draft. There are apocryphal stories of him asking people to get the collected works of Shakespeare. That's baloney. Jackson learned his Shakespeare right here in Jamestown, and he carried it with him to Nuremberg. He had plenty of luggage, but this was not a physical article. It was something that was part of his intellectual greatness without a day of college thanks to the Jamestown High School and Mary Willard. Now, <clears throat> that film clip on, in the second half compiles various pieces of film, some of which have nothing to do with July 26, 1946. The first half, however, uh, is what I wonder if you uh, looked closely at and noticed anything odd about. His tie changed. Mr. Doyle spotted it, uh, trial lawyer, fact spotter. Uh, Jackson is a long necktie guy in the real photos. And that footage shows him standing wearing a black tie, a bow tie. Um, indeed, he was wearing evening clothes. And if you look closely at it, you notice something else odd. The British prosecutors all apparently were legless. Because behind him, you see only chair legs and no human feet. And what's the explanation? That wasn't July 26th either. A couple of days after the Jackson closing statement was concluded, word reached him that the Army Signal Corps, or whoever was supposed to be on the job, had filmed not any of his closing statement. And although he had another pressing engagement, and I will come back to that that evening, for which he was already attired, that created a priority to go down to that courtroom and reenact it, to dummy it up. And so that is Jackson on the night of July 29th, dressed for a social occasion, rereading some passages for cameras to create newsreel footage, and luckily for us, historical footage. Now, the night of July 26th, uh, Jackson had a quiet night, actually. Um, he was, of course, going to be seated and attentive. Shawcross was doing his summation the next day. Um, but. The younger fellows went out, and I want to show you this uh, July 26 evening photo. Bill Jackson is at the back left corner of the table, and two up from him on the left side, chin raised and smiling, is our dear friend, much missed, Henry King. Bill Jackson and Henry King had been college classmates at Yale, and Henry King was a you rah rah Eli, and he organized this Yale at Nuremberg reunion dinner at the Grand Hotel. Um, and so that's their gathering. You can see the only tuxedo is the, frankly, probably desperately poor German fellow who was serving as their waiter. waiter. It was probably a very scruffy tuxedo. And whatever scraps of food and tips and cigarettes he went home with was probably abundant riches in the circumstances of his life. Two nights later, Three nights later, July 29th, Jackson hosted his goodbye party. He was about to fly back to Washington. The case had been bifurcated, and the organization's part of the case was being finished and summed up in August. These individual defendant summations were closing July, and Jackson was going home to get ready for the new Supreme Court term. He threw a big party at his home. Um, I'm sorry, not at his home, at his VIP house, because he really invited everybody. And you can see some women in long dresses. But the fellow in front, uh, maybe the handsomest man in this room, with a drink in his left hand, is Whitney Harris. And I was delighted to find this photo and show it to Whit a couple of years ago and say, do you remember this? And it was actually 2008. Whitney's health was failing. He didn't miss a beat. He said, Jackson's goodbye party. That was a party. <laughs> and I said, who's your buddy? And Whitney paused, and he looked at it, kind of thought. He said. It's a Russian. I have no idea what his name was, but boy, could that guy drink. <laughs> Robert Jackson left the next morning. 
and he flew back Nuremberg to Paris to the Azores to LaGuardia, uh, sort of Fort Totten, and then to National Airport. And that's his return to American soil. He'd been away since September of 1945. I did lift this from somebody else who's got their copyright stamp all across it, but <laughs> you can see the typical Dapper Jackson that's on the tarmac at Washington National Airport. He's got his briefcase in his hand, and he's there to greet his family. That's his wife, Irene, who hadn't seen him since the previous September, and that's uh, a kiss for the cameras. You can see the flash extension there. And that's his full family. Irene, after the kiss, got to put her incredible hat back on. It's uh, Fergie daughter-like, almost, I would say. Um, and on the left is Bill, who had come back with his dad. And next to Bill is his wife, Nancy, who had been without her husband for a year, and Irene, and Bob, and Mary, and Tom Loftus, Tom's parents, greeting Justice Jackson at National Airport. On that plane, he also brought back a couple of his boys. One was Morris Fuchs, and another was a driver. Um, and he gave them a ride because they had enough points, and Fuchs was there to keep Jackson alive, so he didn't need to stay for the organization's case. And I don't quite know the driver's story. Uh, and that's charming enough. You know, this is a VIP plane, 1946 version, but it's a, it's a good, free, expedited gig back to freedom, faster than any other sergeant is getting out of the Army. But then Jackson took them home to Hickory Hill, a night when he could have spent just with his blood relatives and loved ones, he hosted at his home his bodyguard and a Jeep driver, which I think tells you something about gratitude and team mentality and human priorities. Bob Jackson didn't leave the little people behind. He was the little people and understood the little people, and that's what that's about. And then the next day, he drove them to the train station, and they got on a train to New Jersey, and they went to Fort Dix, and they got discharged and Fuchs went to the seminary. But what I really want to tell you about tonight is not just July 26, it's not just this closing statement, which is powerful and I could read you much more, but time doesn't permit. It's not even Robert Jackson. I want to tell you about Charlie Wazanski. Is that a name that anyone knows? Charles E. Wazanski. In his time, he was one of the most distinguished <laughs> federal district court judges in the United States. He was appointed to the U.S. District Court in Boston by Franklin Roosevelt in 1941, and he lived and served a very long time. And when he was young enough, he was a mentioned name for various promotions. He turned down the First Circuit. He liked trials, wanted to be a trial judge. This appellate court stuff was too arid and intellectual for him, although he was a great intellectual and a writer. Um, and because he never went to the First Circuit, the kind of Supreme Court mentioning stopped at a certain age. But before all of that, Charlie Wazanski was a New Deal lawyer. And he had worked closely with Bob Jackson. The years 1935 through 1940, as Jackson's rising from Assistant Attorney General to Solicitor General to Attorney General to Supreme Court appointment, involved lots of litigation. High stakes, high pressure, constitutional litigation. And Charlie Wazanski is part of a team that often is working alongside other teammates that include Ben Cohen, probably the most brilliant lawyer of the century, Tom Corcoran, Bill Douglas, Bob Jackson, Charlie Wazanski, and others. The most famous of the moments is 1937, of course, the court packing spring, when the Social Security Act, massively popular, massively controversial New Deal legislation is being argued before the Supreme Court. And the attorneys who split that oral argument in the Seward Machine case are Bob Jackson, Assistant Attorney General, and Charles Wazanski, on detail from the Securities and Exchange Commission of all places to the Solicitor General's office. They were tight friends. And here's what happened in 1945. Bob Jackson goes to Nuremberg after London, after the agreement, and Nuremberg gets off the ground. And lots of smart people in the United States look at it and say, it's not valid. It's unprecedented, it's retroactive, it's illegitimately ex post facto, it's going to be a kangaroo court, it's not going to be based on evidence, the defendants aren't being provided the resources to fairly defend themselves. Um, this isn't worthy of American law. The most powerful critic in terms of public impact was Charlie Wazanski, who as a matter of intellectual attention, this was what his friend was doing, this is the biggest legal project ever, looked at it hard 
in the fall of 1945, and then went to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge, Massachusetts in December of 1945, and delivered a paper that Nuremberg is illegal and illegitimate. And that paper, two months later, was published as the cover article in the Atlantic Monthly, February of 1946. Bob Jackson at the podium in Nuremberg, Charles Wazanski on the bench in Boston. Charles Wazanski's brilliant critique of what Jackson is doing on the cover of the Atlantic Monthly, and thus every newspaper in the United States and in Europe, and clipped and provided by defense attorneys in the hands of Hermann Goering in the box. Thanks a lot, Charlie. <laughs> but integrity and intellectual honesty are great virtues. One of the people who valued that very highly was Bob Jackson. Now we're back to August of 1946, and Jackson's back with his family. He's figuring out if he can get back for the sentencing without missing more Supreme Court term. He's working on cases, getting ready. He's getting reports and cables, and et cetera, from Whitney Harris, Telford Taylor, and his team in Nuremberg. And he's getting mail. And he gets this letter, which probably is too small for you to read, so I'll begin to read it. August 11, 1946. Dear Bob, you may perhaps be mildly interested to know that your article in the New York Times Magazine section, which is an excerpt from the closing argument, etc., 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 and prolonged reflection have made me change the views I expressed before the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in December of 1945 which were reprinted, as if Jackson didn't know, some months later in the Atlantic Monthly. I believe that your judgment in initiating and planning the Nuremberg trial was sounder than my original criticism. The main issue was whether to deal with the offenders summarily, in other words, a firing squad, or to give them a public hearing with full, underscored opportunity to be heard. And on that issue, I am now persuaded you were right. As to certain subsidiary issues, I probably still disagree with you. But I see no point in going over that ground again. My purpose is only to say that you have won my adherence to your basic principles on this as on so many other matters. Faithfully, Charlie. That's a hell of a letter. It's a hell of a letter to write. It takes a big man to write that letter. And that's a hell of a letter to receive. And thus this reply. August 13, 1946. Dictated, typed, but really I imagine Jackson drafting and redrafting and getting his wording exactly right. My dear Charlie, few letters have ever given me more satisfaction than yours of August 11. I have believed intensely in the Nuremberg trials and in you. And I felt that the general purpose of the trial was one that you certainly would approve of if you were familiar with the whole picture. Dr. Gluck himself, who you credit with having helped to convert you, is a convert. Gluck of Harvard Law School had been on Jackson's staff, become disaffected, left, become a critic, and then kind of come back to being a supporter. As you know, in his first book, he was opposed to trying defendants on account charging aggressive war. I may say that this is symptomatic, for at the beginning of the trials, many of the European powers were standoffish about that. As they went on the trials and unfolded the story, they became cordial the European spectators and evaluators, and towards the profession in Europe manifested its approval in many ways. And now, after a couple of paragraphs where he talks about how the defendants were able to put on a genuine defense and the legal sufficiency of the evidence, Jackson continues, of course it is hard to say what importance will be accorded to the Nuremberg trials. And at this point, I think Robert Jackson can be described as not just writing to Charlie Wazanski in Boston, but is writing to history and writing to us. In some way, perhaps writing to the audience that is Robert Jackson's audience today. It is hard to say what importance will be accorded to the Nuremberg trials, but certainly our military victory is a sterile one if we cannot point to some moral victory which compensates for the enormous moral and material injury done by war. And then he concludes, the nations, meaning the world, have agreed on a set of principles, this is page two, I'm not showing you this, of criminal law and have cooperated in their application. If their acceptance becomes general, it would seem to constitute a moral victory which would make the sacrifices, meaning the military and civilian physical sacrifices, worthwhile. If we do not find that in Nuremberg, I don't know where we shall look for it. 
That's a kind of vision that's greater than the incredible vision that Charlie Wazanski put on the trial. That's a vision that carried Jackson through this very hard assignment and through his very short life in relative terms as he looked to our age and frankly as he looked to our future. Robert Jackson believed in Nuremberg and in you. There's that little guy, regular people, but he believed in Nuremberg. It's the only reason he did it. <coughs> it was the alternative to the path of firing squad and brutality. It was the thing that would sit well in our conscience and make our grandchildren proud of us, he wrote at the beginning of the trial. And at the end of the trial, he said, if this doesn't do it for the world, I don't know where we will look for moral meaning. And you know the story from there. It took five decades of Cold War distancing and inattention. And then it's been just 15 years or so since then of fitful but very substantive progress as the world has looked at Nuremberg. And it's seen a lot of things. It's seen the precedent. It's seen the body of evidence. It's seen the legacies in treaty commitments and tribunals that have been created since then. But I dare say on top of that all, what the world sees is what you're shining the light on. <coughs> the man who believed in it and did it in the first place. And that's why Jackson matters, and that's why I'm so grateful that you're all members of the Jackson Society. Thank you very much, and good night.